So this morning we're looking at John chapter 4 verses 1 to 26, the woman at the well. And you're probably very familiar with the story, so I want to encourage you to look at it through a different lens this morning. And I've given the title to the talk, Mission Impossible. Now, there was actually a Mission Impossible film on Channel 4 last night. I don't know if you saw it. But each of those films will start with the, the challenge, your mission, if you choose to accept it, is blah de blah de blah And I want you to imagine that Jesus is sitting there by the well. And God the Father comes up to him and says, Son, you see that woman who's about to draw water from the well? She's in a mess. She needs help. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to lead her into the kingdom of God. And you've got 30 minutes to do it. Do you accept your mission? And Jesus says, yes, I'm up for that. And God the Father says, go, son, go. So I want you to imagine that. I know it's out of context, but I want you to imagine that that's the mission that Jesus is seeking to achieve. And as we go through the story, that you perhaps think, well, what can I learn in the way that Jesus goes about the mission in terms of what he says and what he does? What can I learn to help me in terms of fulfilling similar missions to help those in need. And as we look at the story this morning, I think there's four themes or four key parts to the story. And I've, all, I've given them each a word beginning with the letter C. So the first one is curiosity. Curiosity. Now, in the English, it says it was about the sixth hour, but the Welsh is better because it says, Aroid tia hane dith. It was noon day. Who goes out at noonday? Only mad dogs and Englishmen. But this woman was going out to draw water from the well at noon. Why? Because she must have been ashamed. She must have been some sort of social outcast because the women would normally go together to draw water from the well either early in the morning or late in the day, not when the sun was at its fiercest at noon. And so Jesus is immediately curious, intrigued. What is going on here? Some months ago, we went through a series in church called Dangerous Wonder, a book written by Mike Iaconelli. And one of the chapters in that was Risky Curiosity. And here's a quote from that. In every mind, there is an enormous store of not knowing, of being puzzled, of wonder, of radical amazement. And I think the challenge for us is that we may be going about our everyday lives and coming across everyday, everyday situations, but then something out of the ordinary may be happening. And we just need to have that sense of curiosity and to explore that. What's going on here? Because it may be that God is leading us into one of those encounter moments that he wants us to get involved in. So the first part of the story is to do with curiosity. And the second part, I would say, is to do with compassion. Compassion, because it sounds quite normal when Jesus says, will you give me a drink? Now, I don't know if you're looking in your Bible what the title is for this passage, because some Bibles will have Jesus and the Samaritan woman, and some Bibles will have the woman at the well. I actually like what's in my NIV version, because it says, Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. That is a headline. That in those times would grab your intention. Jesus, a Jew, talks with a Samaritan woman. Because in those days, you wouldn't even generally talk to women in public. Certainly a male Jew would never 
be seen talking to a woman from Samaria because the Samaritans were regarded by the Jews as ethnically impure. To call somebody a Samaritan was a term of abuse. But here we see Jesus showing his kindness, showing his compassion by initiating a conversation with her. Just to talk to this woman was an act of kindness. I don't know if any of you saw this beautiful animated film over Christmas. I can see Beth Ann putting her hand up. Yeah, yeah. It really was a beautiful film. The boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse. And there's a part in the film when the boy, when the mole says to the boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Beth Ann, can you remember what the answer was? Kind. I thought, what a wonderful answer. Caleb, what do you want to be when you grow up? The answer is kind. And here we see Jesus modeling his kindness, his compassion in the conversation with the woman at the well. A few weeks ago, there was a story circulating around the island. It may have been fake news about an empty hotel that was, had been bought by somebody and the story, the rumor was that it was going to be used to house asylum seekers. And straight away, you saw negative comments on social media and beginning to go around the community. We don't want those sort of people here in that hotel in our community. And I was really saddened to sort of hear some of the responses that were going round. If that happened on our doorstep, what would our response be? What would the response of Kapil Galadi be? Would we show the sort of kindness and compassion towards those people that we would never normally associate with, as Jesus shows the Samaritan woman Going on to the next theme, it's about a big conversation. And I say it's a big conversation because it's big in two ways. It's big because it actually is the longest conversation recorded in the Gospels with Jesus talking to somebody. But it's also a big conversation because of the themes that it touches on and what happens as a result and I think there's four aspects to this conversation. And I've given them all the letter S. And you'll see there, symmetry, strategy, supernatural, and sights. So first of all, looking at the symmetry. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted John and Caris to read the parts of Jesus and the woman is I wanted to try and get across. There's a real flow to this conversation. You know, it's... The conversation to's and fro's between the two of them. It's not one person doing all of the talking and the other person hardly saying anything. But do you know what? Too often, I think, and I put my hand up here, too often we get into conversation with people and we talk too much. We like to hear the sound of our own voice. We like to sound forth of our own opinions, our own views. And it's not a balanced conversation. It's not a conversation that flows. There isn't any symmetry. I have this verse written in the back of my Bible because <clears throat> I know that I fall down on this quite often. It's from Proverbs. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. He who restrains his lips is wise. Last, last week, Phil gave us these cards out to us to uh, help us focus in the right way. It says, he must become greater, I must become less. And sometimes we need to become, I think, a little bit less in our conversations and let the other people become a little bit more 
This is what Mark Twain said once. If we were meant to talk more than listen, we would have two mouths and one ear. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So, <clears throat> when we engage in conversation with people, let there be a proper flow in the conversation. And then it's about, it's about strategy. I love Jesus' strategy in the way that he talks with this woman. And it begins with him saying, can I have a drink? Now, interestingly, it does not say anywhere in the passage that Jesus was thirsty. It says he was tired, but it doesn't say he was thirsty. But he starts the conversation with an innocent request, can, I, can you give me a drink? And then I'm not going to dissect the whole of the conversation, but it talks. About, he, he goes on to talk about water, and then he goes to talk about living water and being thirsty. And to, the conversation begins in the natural, but then Jesus transforms it into talking at a spiritual level. And even though the, the woman doesn't understand straight away, it doesn't matter. The seed has been sown, and the conversation continues. And sometimes we just need to find ways in which to engage people in normal conversation about everyday things and then find that way to sort of bring a hook into the conversation to lead them on to spiritual things, to the spiritual side of a conversation. And the way that Jesus does this is just so clever. And then there's the element of the supernatural because Jesus says to her, go and call your husband. And then she says, truthfully, well, I have no husband. And Jesus reveals that he knows, in fact, that she's had five husbands. And the man that she's living with at the moment is not her husband. Now, it's very important to realize that Jesus doesn't say that to try and make her feel guilty and ashamed. Jesus is saying that just to bring home to her the fact that she still hasn't had or hasn't found fulfillment in her life. She's on her sixth partner, but she still hasn't found fulfillment in relationships. It reminds me of the U2 classic song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And that's what Jesus is saying to her. You still haven't found what you're looking for. You've had five husbands, you're living with a man now, but you still haven't found what you're looking for. So Jesus has put his finger right on the heart of the problem. But there's that supernatural element. And sometimes we really need to supernaturally hear from God when we talk to people for him to reveal to us something that we would not know in the natural, but we can know in the spiritual that will help us to lead that person to the right place. And then the final part is, it's about sacred sites. Sorry, Alan, if we go back. So, because in those days, the Jews would sort of worship at their sacred sites, and the Samaritans would worship at their sacred sites. And the woman says, you know, where should we worship? And Jesus says that it, it's not about a place, because she needs to worship in spirit and in truth. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth is what is required. And that's so, so important because if we ask the question this morning, is this, is this Llangevni football clubhouse a sacred place? And a lot of people outside there would say, no. It's a football clubhouse. You know, to worship God, you need to be in some sort of church building. But Jesus is making the point, and it's such an important truth, that worshiping God is not about the place. It's about how we worship. It's worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. And this morning... I would say to you, this is a sacred place. 
because Jill and James have been skillfully leading us in worshipping God in spirit and in truth. And lastly, the fourth C, it's about the challenge. Because at the end of the conversation, Jesus reveals to this woman that he is the Messiah. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. So Jesus is revealing to this Samaritan woman that he is the Messiah. And the challenge, the invitation, is for her to respond to that, to accept him, if you like, as the Messiah. And you know, that in itself, going back, is a wonderful act of kindness and compassion because what had she done to deserve this challenge stroke invitation. So, Camus, you're into the Gilmore Girls? So, Liz and I started watching the Gilmore Girls, which is a comedy on Netflix, but Liz couldn't get into it. So, we've, we're now watching, we've, we've gone through the nine series of The Office. Really enjoyed that. And we've started watching The Good Place. Anybody watch The Good Place? So, really, really clever. Uh, and, uh, it starts off, and this woman who dies ends up in the good place, which is supposed to be a sort of heaven where only if you've done really good things in your life, you get to go to the good place. But she, through a mistake apparently, she's the wrong Eleanor. They've mixed her up with a different Eleanor, and she arrives in the good place. So she is a bad apple, apparently, in the midst of all these good apples. And the trouble is that that sort of warped theology is accepted by many people out there. They feel that, yeah, as long as I'm fairly good in my life, I'll end up in some sort of good place in heaven. Now, the Samaritan woman would never have ended up in the good place because of the way she'd led her life. But Jesus says, is saying to her, you can get into the good place. Because it's not about what you've done in your life. It's about accepting me as the Messiah, as the Christ. That's what it's about. And one of the reasons why I love this story and why I asked to be able to speak on it is that it resonates with my own experience. And I'm not going to go into it this morning now, we haven't got time, but I went to work one day, and a colleague shared the gospel with me. It started off as an ordinary conversation, turned to the spiritual. He issued me with a challenge. I accepted the challenge, and I became a Christian. And I went back from the end of work a Christian. I arrived at work a non-Christian, had a conversation with a colleague, left, and I was a Christian. And I'm so grateful to that colleague of mine for having that conversation with me and we need to be ready we need to be prepared to do just that peter says always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have always be on the lookout to have that life-changing conversation that you can have with someone so we haven't quite finished the story this week. Next week, Jan is going to conclude the story and we'll get to find out just to what extent Mission Impossible was achieved by Jesus. Mission Impossible 2! <laughs> so I've got some questions for reflection. Uh, to close with and we're going to listen to a song but just for the recording for those who aren't here I'm just going to read out the questions that we reflect on and you can have a few more moments 
to think about these as we listen to a song called The Woman at the Well. So the questions are, how might following Jesus require me to behave in ways our culture finds strange or disturbing? Who are the types or groups of people I tend to shy, shy away from? And what can I do to address that? To what extent, if any, does I must become less mean I should talk less and listen more? How difficult do you find it to introduce Jesus into everyday conversations and share the hope that is within you? And lastly, what part of today's story has motivated or challenged you in becoming more effective in terms of mission?